Hello and welcome. My name is Alison Yates and I'm one of the pro festival producers for Redline, brought to you by South Dublin Libraries and Arts. This year is Galway 2020 and Galway is a European capital of culture and Dara Press have put together this magnificent anthology, Galway Stories 2020, organised by place and street name, walking you through the magnificent city. I will now hand you over to the co-editor of Galway Stories, Alan McMonagall, to introduce you to our panel this evening. Hello everyone, and you're all very welcome to this virtual event from this year's Redline Book Festival, special event to mark Galway Stories 2020. My name is Alan McMonagall, and over the course of the next hour or so, I hope to acquaint you all with some of the contribute contributions that went into the making of uh, the anthology. Um, essentially, Galway Stories 2020, it's it's a collection of and about place. Um, thematically speaking, all the usual suspects have been rounded up. Love, loss, grief, aspiration, despair, survival, madness, coming of age, they're all present and accounted for. Um, the narrative re registers run the well-trodden, though always welcome gauntlets of joy and lament, fear and uncertainty, hope and regret, the antic and the absurd. But first and foremost, this is an anthology suffused with the tang and essence of a, of a small city and far-reaching county on Ireland's western seaboard. The stories themselves make trips far and wide. We visit Clifton and Killary, Barna and Roscahill, we end up in the bowels of Connemara. We head out to that sturdy bastion of East Galway, Ballinasloe. Slow. We even leave the mainland itself at Cleggan Pier, to be precise, and traverse 20 or so minutes of gibbering Atlantic as far as that mystical island of Inishbofin, home to the 5 a.m. swalking corncrake, and indeed provider of refuge to many as the solace-seeking artist. Stories end up in outlying neighbourhoods such as Salt Hill, Naknakara and Roscam. And of course, we find ourselves very much in the thick of it, deep within the alley-wide bars and rinking dink cafes, the resolute night spots and ghostly building sites and various other getting stranger by the moment emporiums of the arts, trade and commerce that grace the, the intricate streets and waterways of the city itself. It was Lisa Frank, uh, like myself, a blow-in, a co-director of Doyra Press, who first pitched me the idea for, for this project and invited me to be a part of the anthology. Doyra Press is a publisher that has been on the go now for 13 years, and they've been publishing to, uh, to, great, a, to great acclaim and successfully for, for pretty much all of that time. I think, um, along with Lisa Frank, our co-director John Walsh and they are to be commended and lauded and indeed fated for their dedication to this particular cause and for their ongoing contribution to Galway's literary adventure. Long may it continue. Doyra Press is a publisher that um, publishes way above its weight. I should also at this point offer a nod to the Arts Council of Ireland and to the Galway 2020 European Capital of Culture team for their support and generosity in making possible uh, the, this, this anthology. As part of the Galway 2020 European Capital of Culture, Small Towns, Big Ideas programme. Okay then, um, with me today are three of the contributors to the anthology, um, themselves who are making a vital part to the unstoppable wave that is contemporary Irish fiction. What I thought I might do is by turn introduce each writer, we'll hear a reading from them. I'll ask a question or two about their individual story and time permitting at the end, we might have a couple of more general questions and comments. First up then, a writer who needs no introduction. Patrick McCabe was born in Clonus, County Monaghan. He is the author of The Butcher Boy, which won the Irish Times Irish Literature Prize for Fiction. 
the dead school, breakfast on Pluto, call me the breeze, mondo desperado, winterwood, the stray sod country, the big Yaru, heartland, and a personal favourite of my own, the adventures of Shea Mouse, the mouse from Longford, early versions of which the author would offer to an entranced bunch of eight-year-olds in St. Michael's Boys National School in Longford Town a long, long time ago. The Butcher Boy and Breakfast on Pluto were both shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize. Woodward was named the 2007 Hughes and Hughes Irish Independent Irish Novel of the Year. He is a past writer in residence in NUI Galway, and his contribution to Galway Stories 2020 is titled The Galway Spike. Without further ado, let me invite Pat to share this roller coaster and ever swerving trip of a story with you. Well, the, Gal the Galway Spike is really written to the full speed of a bow run. There was an old man down by Killyburn Bray, right full tight, full titty full day. There was an old man down by Killyburn Bray, had a curse of a wife with him most of his days. No, he says. As the Christ that rose once may swear on Calvary, nail me above on that cross if I speak to you a word of a lie this night. Well, that's all right, he says. Sits down. Doesn't he commence at the telling of a story? Aye, his scale. There was this fellow, do you see? In a little town that they call Kilcash. In a very dark and deep, quiet part of Ireland. That'd be in the south. See, he said, this fellow, we was living there one time, who thought himself all the big modern type, go ahead. All the big modern type, go ahead, do you see? That would have been, oh, in 1923. When the pictures and the cinema was only just getting started, and when after the Civil War and all that style of thing there, there wouldn't have been all that much to be doing in Kilcag. Only maybe counting your spits at the crossroads. So off he went on the bus to Cork, where he knew of a theatre in it, the wonder of the whole of the south of Ireland, called the Alhambra, do you see? And it being the pride of Tom Toomey, who liked to drink and would often be known to scarper and lave some cans of film, do you see, in the hallway, which well, he did this particular night, yeah, one, two, three, four, five cans of this film, of which he only took two, did Tom, Laurel and Hardy. Asher, how would they not love them, he said. How would me old people not love Laurel and not love Hardy? As back he went to his old hometown, up to Matty McLennan's granary, which, as far as being an hour clone goes, was a very long way indeed from the likes of the Tivoli or the Luxor, or indeed the Alhambra, with the only means of access or exit being the crockety old ladder hanging down from the upper door. Oh, what a show it was going to be, the play of the century, with Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. Well, what a sad and maybe foolish idea it might seem to us all in these new days now with not one or two, but twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, yeah, actually fifty-five people paying for their ticket. As they wrung their hands in excitable glee, one by one, ascending the old rickety rail, which was then pulled up, and the door heavily bolted. But not divil a one ever to show their faces, whether in Kilcash or the world. Keg Toppy nitrate film can burn, given the right or maybe wrong conditions. Tis said that yet in Matty McLaren's granary they can still be heard, the screeches that night that rung out in the Kilcash loft. That's all you're getting now. Thanks for that, Pat. Um, 
Well, I want I want to ask you a couple of a couple of questions, but there's one I've been um, deliberately holding off on up till now, and I hope you have an answer for it. What is the Galway spike? What does it look the spike like? Spike is a, a spike is a doss house. It's funny how these names disappear from the canon, and when when this was read by a few people, reviewers and so on, they attributed all sort of metaphorical significance to the spike. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, people thought it was this and that. It was like it, a spike is where navvies used to lay their heads. A spike is a place where men of the road, mostly men, sometimes women, but mostly men, go and for a shilling a night they get a cup of tea. All the navvies of the forties and fifties uh, spent their days in spikes. So okay. there is a metaphorical element in it, in that there's a spike yeah. kind of. But uh, but by and large, for the purposes of what's happening in the story, it's just a doss house. So it's, I mean, that's that's a good that's an interesting thing. I didn't know that, and because I went no, down most down people don't. Street, it's amazing at... the things that you take for granted. The acceleration of language and the way it has changed in the past yeah. twenty years is extraordinary. Because uh, people of my generation, everybody would have known what a spike was as the generations preceding it, but. Yeah. The exception now is such that so many other words have elbowed it out of the way, and there aren't any spikes yeah. anyway. Yeah. So that's all. I, yeah, but because for, well, just riffing off what you said about the met metaphorical aspect of it. I mean, I was, yeah, I was riffing off all these allusions to uh, Pazuzu and on no, I'm not. I'm not saying and, they're not and, there and, because uh, because the beginning of the Exorcist has has a yeah a kind of a monolith in it, where he's looking yeah, up at the demon yeah. Pazuzu. That's, so while I say that that, that, that that what you're saying is not irrelevant, I'm just saying that for it for it to work in any way as a story, it has to be a realistic, rational element. It can't be all metaphorical, that's all. But the metaphorical no, aspects do, it, do attach to it, yeah. Well, but, no, no, it's very, it's very nice, very reassuring that there is a... We, we um, tack on a literal layer in addition to um, yeah. all the other readings that we're going to make. I mean, the I mean, the story itself. Yeah, I mean, just just ripping off your 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 musical analogy, a reference to the Bowron there. It makes it mixes. Well, it mixes poetry and song and lyric. It mixes language. You know, we 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 have a lovely blend of Irish and the English in there. That 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 uh, fucha fucha, as my mother used to used to tell me, it was called. Yeah. Um, yeah. The story jumps. It jumps, and we jump around a lot. We begin in rural Galway, actually, then move to London, and then there are the various yeah. shenanigans uh, taking place in 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 the scene you read, for example, to mention Kilcash. I think we end up in Cork. Saigon gets mentioned. I mean, is this um, a way of working you enjoy, or can you talk about how... It is. How I, 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 for years, I, I mean, I, I've been moving in this direction for a long time, much to my dismay, because publishers don't get it, and they won't publish it, by and large, because it's not commercial, um, and they can't explain it. So there was a time when this sort of thing would have been seen as perhaps interesting. Now it's problematic. Yeah. But I'm fortunate enough to be the age where I don't really have to care about that. Not financially or anything, yeah. but I just my family are reared and you don't have the anxieties that you have when you're 20s and 30s as a writer, you know. You're just fortunate. And they are very real anxieties and they don't ever go away. So um, to some extent, at that early part of your career, you have to be considered, will I ever get this published? Because there are other people who have to do dreary enough jobs, you know, and can't afford this indulgence of sitting down making up rubbish all day, you know, and not having any justification for it. Um, so, to wind that well, up, it's, it's now, I, I, your question was, is it a way you like working? And it, it is, it suits yeah. my imagination at this point in my life, yeah. Yeah, well, that's well. Ultimately, I think that's what it is. I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful leaps and bounds into the uh, into the imagination, which I think is a big part, a vital part of what should fuel any the generation of any uh, work of fiction. And it's well, it's it fuses or attempts to fuse. You might call the Irish rural Catholic imagination with psychedelia, which I think are actually congruous, <laughs> uh, without being too yeah. absurd about it. But I used to, when I used to no. watch Hendrix, for example, which is before everybody's time here, setting fire to his guitar at Monterey or any of these, it was like a ritualistic mass, really. So they aren't as far apart 
as they may seem. So you're coming of age at 17 or 18 in the 70s, and the world is exploding in psychedelia, and you're reared with the Im imagery of stained glass and ritual. Uh, I'd never really found a form to kind of to accommodate them both, but that's the rural Irish experience and the metropolitan, shall we say, global experience. Uh, elements of folklore. If you think of the work of Bob Dylan, yeah. like coming from Hibbing, Minnesota, yeah. it's very, very similar. <coughs> in that the rationalism or the kind of uh, dead weight of main excessive structure where everything conforms to a three act, you know, sort of template. Necessary as it might be um, in many ways. Yeah. Ultimately, I, at this stage of my life, I find tiresome. <laughs> I don't know about that, but um, I certainly take your point about the three act structure, the the freewheeling, um, free associative style that the, 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 how the story is presented. I mean, but um, it's it's a story not unlike a couple of the other contributions that we're going to hear from quite soon, and um, that actually rewards rereading. And I I thought that three act structure was. Um, Definitely discernible. Um, I mean, short stories. Well, I'm not by saying nature. I don't use it. I'm not saying I don't use it. Yeah. I think it's important. Like, I'm sure in a university, it's one of the first things you would have to teach writers. But that's just so that they can kick it away if they want yeah. to. I mean, it's, yeah. you have to know yeah. these things, and they're they're yeah. useful. Yeah. But uh, I'm I'm only trying to be honest in terms of where I stand now, imaginatively, of whatever for whatever that mm -hmm. might be worth. Is that I really <laughs> reached a kind of an adolescence. At sixty-five, of responsibility in a way, because I know when yeah. I write these things, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit, hit problems because already publishers say, "Well, what is it?" I said, "Well, I don't know. I thought you were the publisher. I thought you understood about <laughs> literature." And uh, no, they say, "No, no, no, we're not. We're not publishers. Well, I don't know what we are, but we're not. We're not fucking buying this anyway." <laughs> 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 oh, so, that's, that's, uh, um, some of the language and some of the language in it, Pat. Um, um, again, feeding into this mix of um, of style. Um, there was one. There was there's a there's a reference to on Gruagach. I mean, I um, Tom Kenny here on Galway was telling me a story about. Uh, there's there's a there's a character called on Glimach that you're liable to be visited upon if you're caught or find yourself traveling across Wolf Tone Bridge, traveling westwards after after midnight. So this this on Glimach is apparently some sort of monster that that's going to rear out of the water there and and, and get you. Um, are these are these language words like that? Are you familiar? I mean, you mentioned Irish folklore. Would you have come across those early on? And oh, all the time. All the time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they are not just they are not just the the monopoly of the west of Ireland. You know, the Midlands of Ireland has them too. And you know, Gruag I mean to be a perfect metaphor for COVID now, being chased by something you don't see yeah. or understand. So yeah, whether yeah. these things, like they often say that, uh, you know, the changeling was postnatal depression, maybe that there are all sorts of kind of uh, symbols and things that are used to it. because we don't know anything more about the world now than Jesus or Plato did, really. Like all this internet, it's all a bunch of toys. Look how powerless mm. we are now. When the when I mean, in the former times, it would have been the Almighty or his obverse that did this. But you know, in the age of secularized language, you know, everyone is so so kind of on top of things we see. But we're actually as terrified as people would have been hundreds of years ago when when true powerlessness visits you. So yeah. uh, I've never been a rationalist at all, and don't understand the point of it in a way because. You never get to a point where you're able to have the dead visit you, you know. They'll never come so back and tell in, you what it was like. Yeah. Hmm? Do you, be, you believe in ghosts? Do you believe in ghosts and so forth? And that well, they, I, that they, I that don't they know do if we necessarily believe with them, but they're there anyway. <laughs> <My Yeah>. <laughs> 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 I'll ask you one more question because um, there was a, there's another story and your story it it, it it and finishes up in Mick Taylor's bar in Dominic Street um, there yeah. right right beside this uh, Galway spike that I now know is a Doss house um, one of the other stories Socrates in his later years uh, plays out yeah. entirely in Mick I, Taylor's bar also. I really enjoyed that I was just yeah. wondering 
Yeah, yeah, Alan Cadden's story is really good. Um, I was, is, I was yeah. just going to ask you about the pub, the pub setting um, in general, or specifically Mick Taylor's bar, which again is a landmark um, premises in 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 the old part of Galway. Um, is there anything about that in particular that appealed to you? Well, the soccer um, story reminded me of so many people that I knew, you know. I mean, I remember being in that bar and this guy in a long coat, as it, as it turns out, like Alan's uh, character, said to me, you have to be very careful, you know. And I said, why? I see the crows. I said, what about them? Oh, he says, don't ever trust them, you know. And I said, well, why would you not trust crows as opposed to guillemots or gulls or any other form of avian traveller? He said, well, I was out in the yard the other day, he said. And all I could hear was, ha, ha, and they were shouting at me. I knew they were specifically <laughs> shouting at me. And I said, well, how did you know that? He says, don't you ask me cheeky questions. Just just listen when someone's talking to you. So I said, well, what did you do then? He says, well, what I did was I crept into the kitchen and I got some bread dough and I started, and I made sure to put plenty of stuff into it. And I put them all over the yard. And I waited for about an hour and... I said, did you? He said, yeah. What happened then? He said, there wasn't so much ka 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 then, he said, because they were all coming out of the skies like grenades, he said. I said, was there many of them? He said, there must have been 150. I said, what, crows are lying all over the yard? He said, yeah. Yeah, there was about 150, I'd say. And now there wasn't a word out of them then for the rest of the evening. <laughs> so we finished the drink when, when, when he was gone I said to uh, the barman who's, who's that guy he said oh he's from Ballinasloe Low Mental Hospital he said that um, he said that he's always given out about the crows but he has the measure of it because what he used to do was put largactyl into the dough he used to steal largactyl and put this uh, sedative into these little pullets of dough and leave them all around leave them all around the yard of the hospital and these crows would come out like fucking Hiroshima feathers and not a word out of them. So that, that, sort of, that sort of story used to send me off with a spring in my step. Uh, that's, that's biblical. And it's also, it's also very good advice, I think, for any, any, any budding writers out there. Just shut up and listen because look what you're liable to hear. <laughs> Gold, absolute gold. Thanks. Well, it was full Thanks of people like that, you know, not necessarily from mental yeah. hospitals, but kind of dr drifters <laughs> and kind of outside people. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, no, it was always an interesting place to visit and there was an edge to it. Mm. And um, and it reopened again a couple of years ago, just to let you know. So um, if we that. ever come out of it, yeah, we, if we ever emerge from this present tunnel, it's a possible uh, reunion of sorts. Um, thanks so much for that, Pat. I'm going to move on Pleasure. to our second leader now, if that's okay. Um, Elaine, Elaine Feeney. Elaine Feeney has published three collections of poetry. Where's Katie? The Radio is Gospel and Rise, as well as a drama, Wrongheaded, commissioned by the Liz Roach Company. Her poetry has been widely published and anthologised in the Poetry Review, The Stinging Fly, The Irish Times, Copper Nickel, Stonecutter Journal, to mention but a few. Her short fiction is published and forthcoming in publications to include The Art, The Glimpse and Winter Papers. Most recently of all, her debut novel, As You Were, was published by Harville Secker. And if I start into the effusive and ongoing praise, acclaim and all round enthusiasm the novel has been met with, I'm afraid we will be here all day. Suffice to say, it's a wonderful book. I would urge you all to seek it out. Elaine teaches at the National University of Art in Galway and in St. Jared's College in Tume. Her contribution to Galway Stories 2020 is titled Sojourn which I now invite her to read from. Thanks very much, Alan. Um, that was funny about Mick Taylor's. Um, I was borrowed, actually, from Mick Taylor's <laughs> back in the day when it became a um, another venue. But it's back as a pub now, so that's good. Anyway, we'll talk more on that in a little while. So, yeah, my story is um, Sojourn, and it's um, based on the island of Inish Boffin. And it's in the voice of Sylvia Plath and the time that she spent there um, in the 60s, the early 60s. It was autumn. A 
and decided that husband and I would holiday on the west coast of Ireland for a brief sojourn and to visit a small island off the town of Cleggan and the park where Yates has a tree with names etched into it of writers and dreamers. We were to be the guests of the poet Richard. Husband said that I'd decided it to get away from the squalling babies. But I seem to remember it differently. This is the way of us. Whatever the rationale, the trip was beginning to cause me much anxiety after all that had been and gone. For now we had different abodes, husband and I, and the unsettling came at me as a pulsing, not as sounds, but the accumulation of tiny vibrations, like the children's early vows, or cutting a beef tomato and the knife pulsing off the wooden plinth. I fear the power of knives. So I threw away the soft red tomato slice in the trash and left the knife down, out of reach of the children. I do not like packing, especially for this trip, where I wasn't entirely sure in what capacity I was joining husband, or even Richard, of whom we would be guests, given my letters with him. Perhaps it was indeed that husband would accompany me in some guest house, but even this detail was uncertain, and I berated myself compared myself with mother, who would have asked questions, been quite certain of her rank and the order of things before her departure. And Inish Boffin was sea-locked without a bridge of any kind. And that set me to fretting about the water and if I would ever rediscover my sea legs. I found this alarming, another thing to add to an overcluttered to-do list, as though packing my suitcases and dressing myself accordingly weren't enough of an ordeal. Now I must go and actually find something that isn't in the least tangible, sea legs. I grew increasingly concerned about the boat, a hooker named the Ave Maria, and so that by the time we arrived in Cleggan, I had indeed forgotten my physical self entirely. Husband chatted about class on the trip, himself, Richard, the islanders. Everywhere we went were long and rude conversations about the idiocy of people, ordinary people, writers, women. I always find the English or the Anglo-Irish English so obsessed about class and the manners of people. This surely must come from the shallowness about oneself, for I'm quite sure that husband is most concerned about the ignorance of his own broad tongue. Yet, despite the conversations, I don't know how the native Irish class determine themselves from the Anglo-Irish class, but I can easily spot the difference, clothes or shoulders, and of course, the broadened, beautiful vowels. Richard didn't have the appeal of an Irish voice, and I liked that, the timbre of which could excite me. His was rather slim and nasally. And after some time at Cleggan, awaiting Richard and his boat to moor at Nemo's pier and take us to Boffin, husband, tiring of waiting and seeming unimportant in reflection of the vastness of the Atlantic Ocean, suggested we go and get a drink in a public house with the locals, because this was an Irish custom before bo- boarding a boat. And he was ever so polite with customs that were manly and existed in a bar. Also, they'd asked for his signature in their guest book, and I thought it might lift his spirits were he to leave his mark somewhere. The pub was pleasant, if a little dark, and immediately upon stooping under the door, husband went and signed their book, like one does in a boarding house. And I noted, much to my upset, that he didn't use our address, the one we share with our children, and I was conflicted. I wanted to both fuck him and kill him in that very moment, but this was our way, and for now I thought, rather haughtily, he could stay in Halifax and let Halifax mind him, for he... Well, he needed so much minding, giving so much away to people he had never met, people who would pour over his signature in the weeks to come and ask all sorts of questions. Of course, this village seemed far too real for the wants and whims of poets. Perhaps they would think that maybe we had a holiday home or maybe a fixed abode somewhere about, and this settled me somewhat. I'll leave it there. Thanks a lot for that, Elaine. Intriguing excerpt. <laughs> um, and I think you've already alluded to it there in your in your own brief introduction. The story, the story, it, it's told in the first person um, from the point of view of a famous 20th century American poet. Um, I wanted to ask you, 
Um, there's kind of two parts to this question. What interests you in Sylvia Plath? Uh, what interests you in Sylvia Plath on the island of Inish Boffin? Well, actually, I think I became intrigued when we went over to that festival, that conversation festival, Alan, that you were very much part of. And the um, there was a memorial at the time for the poet Richard Murphy on the island. Um, and I was I read a poem of, of Murphy's at that memorial. And um, later on, someone remarked to me that they really loved my poem. I, I really loved your poem, uh, this person said. And then they said, and I, I didn't realise it wasn't actually your poem. And it means so much different to think that it was Murphy's poem. And I thought that was very interesting. And I said, why? And they said, well, of course, accent, of course. So anyway, that was the first thing that started to intrigue me. Um, but the story of that kick, like that 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 interesting five day holiday that Hughes took with Plath in Ireland, is is mad. Like if you think of the state their relationship was in, and I mean it's a completely daft thing for me to do to go and write a Sylvia Plath story. I mean no one should ever do anything as ridiculous and bizarre and absurd as that. But I just really wanted to try to investigate how her mind was like you know she said she wanted to desperately get away she needed a boat to sea and no squalling babies and you know i thought yeah i can get that vibe <laughs> no I squalling hear, baby. you know yeah yeah well just on like the, what happened well, under just, the table you know what yeah. happened I, I'm, I'm mad to know sorry and and did you tease out any any fictional possibilities yourself? Did you let your own imagination run riot with that? I mean, um, or yeah, yeah, more... that's a good question. I tried to be um, um, I tried to be as factual as I could be with the actual facts of the event. Uh, yeah. What I noticed I was staying away from is you know they they. Apparently, they went Murphy and and Platt, and actually um, Hughes and Kinsella went to uh, dinner that evening, and that's when you know something a bit of footsie happened under the table, or or so Murphy would have have us believe. But I I was just intrigued as to her perspective because you know she can't really write yeah. it. Um, yeah. His poem had won a competition as well. That's how they were in they were in a conversation because she had judged. I think it was the Guinness Poetry Competition. She had won that competition the last the year before, and Murphy won it with the Cleggan disaster that, about that, okay. that the the sinking of that ship and and nine fishermen yeah, yeah. off and forty five in total lost their lives in that disaster. Um, Which and you I think also she was alluded taken to by in the story. story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Oh yeah, oh, and you also allude to this. Correct me if I'm wrong. In in Sojourn, in no, in, correct. in the story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So, I think she found it very sad. And so did you, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious, did you, would you, like, did you, the voice, you know, getting inside Sylvia Platt's head, I mean, did, did you, did you, yeah. did you do any research or is the poetic license to, or um, a blending, a meshing of both? Well, um, I, just, I'd read all just, the just, journals just, on, sorry, there's a delay on my, on my, I feel like I'm interrupting you all the time. Sorry, Alan. There's a delay on my net, my internet here. Um, I read, I had read all her her, her journals and, I, and letters and anything I could get my hands on. You know, the the, the unabridged. And I brought that around Europe for five weeks. And um, on we we were doing this train trip around Europe with the kids. And of course, I got deep into the mindset of Sylvia Plath. <laughs> I was speaking in a different accent, which I'm actually very prone to do. And I get very fed up with my own hiberno shtick sometimes when I write, you know. Um, not that there's anything wrong with it, but I do sort of tire of myself, <laughs> the Elaine voice, you know. And I, I have different voices yeah. that I put forward then um, at times to sound a little bit more lofty. So I suppose when I got into her way of thinking, that's how I got the voice. Um, but I, I like I'm never going to get that. I'm never going to nail that. I listen to a lot of recordings as well. There's some BBC recording. There's one really good one with herself and Ted, and like they said, they're like two strangers to each other. Bizarre. Oh yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, and I just, of course yeah. their. I think their relationship was already on the rocks by the time they rocked up in Boffin. Is that accurate enough? 
I think, yeah, 100% sure he he was having his dalliance at that stage. But um, I think that yeah. what I felt for Sylvia with all uh, these papers, you can find lots of them, and Richard Murphy's own book, uh, published by Grant as well. But um, I just felt for a woman that was so desperate to get the attention of this man, that's, that, you know, dare I say yeah. it. And he, there's no way, like, it doesn't matter what way she presented herself. And I think the story really... Gets into that about herself presenting herself, even on the boat, even in the in the bar, the pier bar, even in the bo- the guest house with the woman of the house, and, and and the woman of the house brings in a jug of water. This is fiction, like obviously parts of it are fiction. I to try to imagine this, and she says, "I don't know what I should do when I come, you know, face to face with some a situation like this. Am I supposed to wash myself?" Basically, so there was a lot of that double thinking. But I mean. Um, yeah, the, the the ending of the story where the actual event happens, the whole crux of the story, I, I found that one hard. I, I, I found it hard to get into yeah. that the ending of it. I just wanted to leave that like blank and kind of do it. You know, fill in your own words here, reader. Oh, yeah, <laughs> but you I wouldn't let me do that, ending... Alan. Well, I think the I think the ending uh, as is 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 beautiful, um, and you know you managed to 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 smuggle in that um, that lovely animal at the Spoking Corn Creek. It's uh, one of my favourite moments in 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 well, indeed the, the well, entire collection. It's done very nicely, and isn't that, it lovely to get? Yeah, lovely yeah. to uh, sorry. Lovely to get a story, I think, on Inishbofin. It's such a great place. Pat, you've been out to Inishbofin as well, correct me if oh, I'm Oh, yes, wrong, I have indeed, certain. yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm very fond There's of it out the, there. They had, they had to put an yeah. SOS out for you, um, if I remember rightly. Um, Patrick King, the <laughs> key man out there. I was down That's in, right. I think I was at, at mm-hmm. I think I was in either at Bantry or Listowel, the festivals there. And I, and and Padder King, the, the the daily boat had just arrived over from Cleggan, and they were expecting you know um, a lad in a beard to 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 disembark and walk down the walk walk down the plank. But you managed to you managed to slip by them, and I think this was two o'clock, and I think you were due on stage at three o'clock, and there was no more boats that day. Well, there was and a whole Padder, load of other writers. There was a whole load of other writers on the island that time. They could have got anybody they wanted then. Did you go paddle boarding, Pat? No, I, <laughs> I, went off, I went off collecting <laughs> seashells in my bucket. That's what I really yeah. went over there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the black... a, Yeah, the black gate, think... you're right. Yeah, he does. He runs the black gate, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, but what had happened was you had shaved and he didn't recognise you without the beard. So, you know, you just walked oh, past him. Was, and he had yeah, no, yeah, he, yeah. He had no, but he had sent out, he had sent out SOSs to everybody. I think he did. Barry got he did, yeah. I, got I must one. say, Basically, I must, I was, I was very flattered. I was very flattered. Yeah. All this attention. <laughs> 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 they were afraid you'd do a uh, Theodore Reski or however you pronounce his surname. Yeah, 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 that's right, yeah. That's right. They'd have to get the cream for it. it. <laughs> that's right, yeah, fantastic. Got to build up a whole mythology well, around that, and all it was was no whiskers. I l- <laughs> <laughs> Could have been worse. Could have been no whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> An entire anthology on Inish Baffin and Whiskers, and I thought it was great that Inish Baffin man- managed to f- to find its way into it, it, in, into the collection. And actually, um, ah, yeah, I yeah. Think, I think it was somebody out there as well mischievously said it to me because um, they weren't even sure. Sometimes you know it, it's kind of on the boundary there, out just you know off the mainland, straddling Mayo and Galway. And the way it was explained to me anyway, um, mischievously, was that when Mayo reaches the final, Inish Boffin is part of County Mayo. And when Mayo oh, okay. loses, oh, really? the final, loses the final, it reverts back to being in County Galway. I, I, I just but it has a strong literary history anyway, not just oh, Ted yeah. Hughes and Sylvia Pl- Like, uh, yeah. I lived on it. It kept stuff going shooting rabbits out there. Sidney Bernard Smith yeah. lived on it. Philip Larkin was yeah. there, wasn't he? Yeah. Was Larkin there yeah. then? I, I don't so. know what Larkin there, no. Uh, I, I'm thinking was, Kevin Barry has that great story, the bug house as yeah. well, doesn't he? 
Yeah, there's some great stories that have come out of there. I, it, there's a magic to it. The corn crake squawking yeah. is, a, is a very interesting sound. Kind of frightens the life out yeah. of you late at night, early yeah. hours of the morning. Yeah, I think you can, um, I can see uh, it a little bit. Yeah, I love it. There is a story Sorry, about... There is a story about uh, Rithke, Rith, Theodore Rithke, the American poet. I mm. think he had to be escorted off the island uh, by the by a local priest, and literally all the way as far as the madhouse in in Ballina Slow. I mean, so um, that I don't. That's that story one comes pr- from um, Kieran Day. Yeah. He taught with me in Jarlis, um Saint Jarlis, Kieran. You know, days on the island, and Kieran was. Um, woke as a very young boy to go and run and get the priest for Teddy, <laughs> who was raving, um, obviously. So so as a young boy, he said he was petrified. He had to knock on the priest's door and wake him from his slumber um, and, he, and, uh, and get him. And he said, uh, yeah, he was taken then and ended up in Ballinasloe. But from what I've read about his time in Ballinasloe, he really liked it because there was an orderly would bring him out for a pint in the evening. <laughs> So he had a nice time in Balmaslow in the hospital there. So um, yeah, but I, yeah, Kieran told me all about it because he lodged with, I think, the day. Yeah, he lodged with Kieran's family out there. That's nice. nice. I'm getting very jealous. Yeah. Here. I've never set foot in this place. What? Danny, I was just. You might about, never yeah, come back, but, Danny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's well worth a visit. Um, on one of your, uh, hopefully, you will get to make your 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 annual annual pilgrimage. Um, I might just move on to your good self now, Danny. Actually, um, you've oh, been yeah. sitting there for a little while. Uh, I'll, 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 so Danny Denton is from Cork with an MA in writing from NUI Galway. His first novel, The Early King and the Kid in Yellow, was published by Granta in 2018. Amongst other publications, his work has appeared in The Stinging Fly, Southward, Granta, Winter Papers, The Dublin Review, Banshee, The Guardian, The Irish Times, Architecture, Ireland and The Big Issue. He is also the editor of The Stinging Fly magazine. On numerous occasions, so we'll get your go a bit in here, Danny. On numerous occasions, Danny has claimed that his favourite journey is his annual pilgrimage to the International Court Literary Festival in Galway. His connection to Galway, therefore, is rock solid. His contribution to Galway Stories 2020 is titled Motorbike Accident Ross Cam. And I'd now like to invite Danny to the virtual lectern uh, to share an excerpt or more from his story. Thanks, Alan. Um, and thanks, I suppose, to um, Lisa as well for, for, for helping for the invitation to do a press. Um, very difficult to follow uh, Pat and Elaine, and especially difficult because the story I've, I contributed is kind of um, much, much bleaker, maybe, <laughs> and less engaging. Um, but it's about um, it's about a motorbike accident uh, on the road in Ross Camp. Uh, and I'll read the first couple of pages. Um, I guess the only thing to say is that we land right in the moment of the of the accident. The electricity poles about six meters from where Whitey's body comes to a rolling stop. At about 16 metres, they'll determine a few hours later, with measuring tapes and wheels and unhurried steps, 16 metres from where Trev's body has landed, or has been flung. So the difference between driving the bike, guiding the handlebars and riding pillion mere inches away, still within the embrace of a passenger and a driver, is therefore 10 metres in two directions. Inches become metres in a moment. Whitey and Trev grew up three doors from each other on the terrace, a distance of about 12 metres. Whitey is younger by seven weeks. What's dominant is not pain or panic, but an awareness of pain in images. There's pain in the electricity pole crackling above him, casting light across a dense sky, unmoved despite the speed at which they struck it. Struck 
as a word that he'll use in later years, Whitey, at first subconsciously, then after some minor revelation, consciously struck. It will feel right because of the way its pronunciation seems to tear apart at the beginning, struck, and yet collide again at the end, K struck. There's pain in the bank of spindly leafless poplars that shiver on the horizon of his vision and pain in the crayon line of silver cloud running three quarters of the way across the dark sky, across what might be Galway Bay, if he, Whitey, happened to know which direction he's facing. And the awareness of pain results from wrongness. Everything in the world is wrong now, because the world just happened to come apart for a minute there, like the word struck. And when it collided back together again, it was all crooked, all pained or an awareness of pain in images. The language he'll use when months later he finally starts talking about it will make it seem like he was in a sequence of battles with the world, like a rivalry. And his narrative will be that he lost this particular battle, this particular battle, of course, being a major one in the course of the war. His physio, Darren, will initially like Whitey as they go through the rudimentary post-paralysis routines. But eventually, the I got caught language and statements like, you make one mistake, Darren, and the world fucks you. That'll get to Darren, because as he'll later often explain to his housemate Kitty in the evenings, in that physio suite, lined as it is with mirrors, this guy who insists on being called Whitey, by the way, and not simply Graham, this guy just can't see himself. In a room full of mirrors, he's blind to himself, Darren will say, more than once himself needing these debriefing sessions with a supportive other. He's there, Kitty, and he's surrounded by himself, unable to avoid his banjax legs, the scar on his jaw, the rebuilt shoulder, and he simply can't fucking see that it's his own fault. The world didn't fuck him. He fucked up, majorly. There's no one to blame but himself. That's so fucking patriarchy, Kitty will repeatedly say to blame the world for your own bullshit choices. But would it be so wrong under the amber glare of this streetlight, the streetlight tall and steadfast, cyclopic, utterly unwavering, glaring down on all it beholds in the street, the bike half shattered on its side, the right fork buckled completely, pieces of frame and windshield strewn across the old Dublin road, Trev's body unmoving, twisted and wrung like a dish towel, Whitey's body unmoving, half unfurled on the flat of its back, submitting to the crackle whispering street light, to the long row of leafless poplars that shiver in the night turning morning, running out beyond the street light scope, waiting nervously for a response to this collision, for what will happen next. Would it be so wrong to say that maybe the world has always been wrong, since the day Whitey was born, or that Whitey's world was wrong, and what's happened is that he's finally come face to face with it. Maybe. Later, there will be a courthouse, and there will be some time spent shivering in a wheelchair on the courthouse steps, waiting on a verdict, the word suspended sentence reverberating in the mind. But actually, looking out from those courthouse steps onto the cold columns of the town hall theatre, He'll be thinking of before, long before, when he was Graham, during an under-15s Gaelic football game, when he went up to catch a kick-out, the ball falling from the sky into his reaching his arms, into his reaching arms. Time can slow in moments like that. And I leave it there. Thanks a lot for, thanks a lot for thanks that, Danny. Yeah. No bother beautifully read um, and it is an intriguing story and deaf technical accomplishment as well um, for a piece so brief and um, or just something I was curious about as well Danny just from uh, most kind of an obvious question um, but it, the story itself is about this character of why he has life is forever changed after this you know, tragic accident um, an accident that seems, well, that is literally and figuratively um, suspended in time, suspended in time throughout the narrative. I was just, uh, when 
when did when did you conceive the story and could you just talk a little bit about how it um developed subsequent to that yeah i know you're... i don't i don't know when i conceived of it um but there are several things going on in my head there's you know you start, you hear certain things and they stick with you for a long time or certain things happen um the the, the notion of the story a motorbike accident um uh, drunk drivers and uh, the guy kind of the driver of the vehicle um having a kind of a victim complex that's an anecdotal thing that, that i know about that happened in galway um and kind of um always kind of graded on me somehow or there's something i that i was never felt comfortable thinking about that story um but th there was a, cl a closer thing was um a long a long time ago um maybe 15 years ago my father was in a car accident um and he was uh, just driving driving one night uh, in cork um in the kind of in the countryside and another car came out of absolutely nowhere at a crossroads i didn't know it had to stop at the crossroads and just pin my dad's car um to the kind of to the ditch um and my dad he was uh, ultimately okay like lots of kind of minor injuries some broken ribs nothing that um he was in hospital for a few weeks and then he was he was able to come out and he was okay but he um didn't talk about it for ages couldn't talk about it um and then when he started talking about it he wouldn't shut up like every day it would come up somehow and he would be constantly referencing it and re-referencing it and it always like i always kind of go, why does he keep talking about it um, and obviously it's a trauma thing and um, once you start you you're reframing it but the interesting thing then as i kind of this is long before i was thinking seriously about being a writer i suppose as i kind of learned my craft and was constantly working on stories i just saw a real parallel in that his he was constantly rewriting the story of what happened in, a, in an attempt to understand what happened and why he saw such a yeah. random thing nearly yeah. killed him um, and so that's kind of was stuck in my head then that we are always doing this we're always reframing yeah. rewriting yeah. redrafting various stories in our lives or the story of our lives or whatever however you want to to do it um and so i kind of wanted to try and capture that in a short piece um yeah yeah you've actually kind of answered the, um, the, the very next question i was going to ask you because it's just in relation yeah to what i consider a, 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 yeah quite a quite a deft technical accomplishment in a short in a short you know space and it, you know, the story travels you know not, not much more than a few pages and yet you have these um zooming in and out there are flash forwards and flash backs you like parcel out the details of the accident and then subsequent moments if you like in the in in, in the character's life um and when, once he begins to talk out the event and um, therapy and so forth what i noticed the the, the, the slight changes and the slight variations um in the versions and obviously that was something that did um occur to you from the anecdotal point of view mm. was it something that you were trying to aim for in the writing of the story yeah well, well there was yeah there was something um yeah it's kind of tricky to talk about because it's a story that yeah. like i say i know it anecdotally yeah. if i talk too much about it it actually becomes less anecdotal and more specific to a, a place and a time <laughs> but what i would say is in re in reframing um these stories and retelling these stories we get the chance to edit what happened to us yeah that, where, where yeah. whereby whereby yeah. the truth the kind of you know that old thing never let the truth get in the way of a good story um that kind of can work in kind of weird and um, more disturbing ways as well where someone gets written out of the story completely and you, you don't really think about yeah. it but i kind of definitely yeah. that was on, in my mind that, that the focus in in the piece would be constantly on whitey and how he's rewriting his story that you would you would start to forget someone else that there was two people on the bike um uh yeah that's that was the attempt yeah, and I think again yeah. it lends credence to that thing that um, uh, a short story rewards rereading, and I because you know, I've read this now a few times, and that was that's what started to emerge, if you like, that um, yeah, Whitey is retelling and retelling and retelling this story, whether it's for himself or for whoever he's with or whoever is um, willing to listen to it again, 
and um, it's the other, it's the other character is gradually fading and fading and fading. And it's 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 quite an interesting development again in such um, in within the narrow corridor that the that that, that this short story dwells in, um, and indeed it's it's it it makes the accomplishment all the more effective I think because you're we're almost in the territory where we're in danger of re repetition which can be the death knell well to any piece of writing mm -hmm. let alone something as brief as as a as an eight-page story, so uh, yeah, no, no, I, I certainly I, take I my hat thought off. It would be, that. I always thought it would be really interesting, and and kind of going back to what Pat said, start completely unpublishable for marketing reasons. It would be really interesting <laughs> to try and write, be it a story or a novel, to try and write the same thing five times and make the reader read it five yeah. times, and yeah. but have these yeah. little differences. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe a little bit like the Lisa yeah. Simpson kind of jazz joke, like you have to listen to the notes that they're not playing. But it would be really interesting to try and do the exact yeah. same thing five times, but with variations, and that the movement of the piece would be in the variations, not in the story repeated. But I don't know, maybe maybe when 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 all my anxieties about, about making money and getting published fall away, I will attempt to write that story. Yeah, no, no. I, <laughs> we'll put it on the syllabus, Danny. Oh, thanks, sure. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, let me. How are you all with all of this? Um, you know, this, 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 the the elephant that's in the that's in the virtual room. Um, how are you? Well, I'll, I'll ask Danny first, as 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 you're up. Um, um, I'm, I'm, I wasn't I'm sure okay, if I wanted I'm to like... ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> I think no. I think it's a really interesting thing to ask people because, as, you know, and you know, people who largely do their work at home as well. Um, because I uh, actually came up. I did an event last night, um, and it came up, um, and the Israeli writer Edgar Carrot was was just saying really interesting things about um, how it had affected him. He said he said that he wrote out of. He said my initial desires to write probably came from um, some boredom anxiety and lots of yearning and he said um that's how i kind of when i was he was doing i guess national service or something and that's how he started writing and uh, he said that the pandemic has been the most prolific writing period of his career uh, for the same reason lots of boredom lots of anxiety and lots of yearning and i was listening to that kind of going that's really uh, inspiring and cool it's been the exact opposite experience uh, for me I've, I've gotten hardly anything done um, and I found it very difficult to concentrate um, I've, I've, I would be someone who's very good at putting away the phone and not looking at the phone for long periods of time but I've found that I'm looking at the phone every 30 seconds and there's nothing even to see every 30 seconds but I'm just constantly looking for news looking maybe for I don't know some sense of security or surety or something um, it's very interesting what Pat what you were saying at the start about those kind of those old demons and gods that people kind of use, well, may or may not have used as kind of boogeymen or something to, in a societal sense. And then now there's a kind of a very real boogeyman. I still think there are aspects of it being used in terms of like fear and things like that, but I've no doubt that yeah. it's there, and I've no doubt that yeah. it's, you know that it's very real and very scary. Um, but in, I have to also say, that being honest, in general, I've, I've, I have a son who's uh, 13 months old. We've kind of been on lockdown since he was born because the first year of a child yeah. life, you're just <laughs> chasing him around and feeding him and working. And that's kind of what we've been doing. So when the actual lockdown, like, you know, um, when we weren't allowed to walk more than two kilometers from the house, that kind of didn't really change our daily life very much. Um, Except with the exception yeah. of missing family, we couldn't see our family. Uh, that was really tough. Yeah. But other than that, life was kind of went on as normal for me. Uh, yeah, yeah. What about you, Elaine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a bit like that John Prime song, you know, some days you're up, some days you're down, and I think that's life anyway. Um, I suppose for me, uh, I started this like in 2014 because I was in lockdown for 18 months, lying in bed on my own, recovering from illness. Um, trying to tell everybody that it was really hard <laughs> lying in bed watching trash TV all day. Um, and now I think, you know, everyone else is catching up. I, I, I think I find that part of it really interesting is that we, we, we're we such an ableist world and um, while Zoom and all this isn't isn't 
ideal, I think it allows a lot more inclusivity and, you know, I'm trying to look at the positives of all the whole mess, you know, but, um, sure. yeah, I think, it, you know, my son turned, my oldest son turned 18 in the summer and it was nice actually in some ways to have the last few months with him. He was stuck in and had to play Monopoly with us. Um, which I'm sure he was thrilled about. Uh, <laughs> couldn't be going out chasing women. So, you know, Mammy was thrilled with that for a little while. So I feel like I kind of just grabbed the last little sun rays of his, of, of his childhood as I knew it maybe, you know, and for me that was kind of special and that would never have happened. So look, I suppose I've looked at the positives. Like Danny said, um, scrolling a lot. I think I, someday there's going to be a surreal moment that I'm just going to scroll my way into some sort of other world experience like Alice from Wonderland. Uh, I think we're all scrolling. There, there's been an awful lot of talk about books and everybody's buying books and everybody's reading books. Um, I do I, I do hope that for the winter we can all get off the phones and stop. We're not going to hear anything good by constantly checking and rechecking things. And I don't think there was nearly as many books read as people were talking about. Everyone I spoke to said, no, no, geez, I have no attention span. So I hope now we can actually settle in and get, get you know, read those books we always wanted to read and watch those films we always wanted to watch. But it's really tr- hard. It's been a really hard time. My grandfather died during the last lockdown. So that was tough, just the whole funeral situations and everything. Yeah. I know it's tough. Um, a pat, pat, your mortal fear of the cinemas going by the wayside. Well, you know, I'm such a sentimentalist about the, the cinemas because I've spent my life in them, and um, I really do believe that it's a, it's a democratic art form that's now yet another one gone. I think that there is no doubt about it that the cinemas that we, as we knew it, won't be there in two years' time. Yeah. Which are genuinely, I'm not given to depression about these things, but I am sad about that because I love going to movies and uh, not just family reasons. I just like going to them. I always have. Yeah. And uh, I, 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 I don't think there's any way. Yeah. I don't think there's any way back for it. I think that they're crippled now. And I don't know because, how because all this. Because they're not sustainable, Pat, or. or... Well, <clears throat> when I first became alarmed about this was an article by David Thompson a couple of months back in the New Yorker. And David Thompson is, you know, apart from being a really fine critic, he's also a very reliable sort of anthropologist of culture, you know. And uh, he was talking about his love of cinema and an awful lot hedged, he said, or hung on the release of Tenet, you know, this um, um, mm-hmm. movie, the b- b- bullets flying arseways movie, whatever, <laughs> what's it called? <laughs> then it came upside down. Um, what's his name? The, the, the um, memento, Christopher Chris Nolan. Nolan. Yeah, Nolan. Chris Nolan, Nolan released yeah. this. This well, he went along to this. David Thompson went along to uh, the release of this movie in a major cinema in New York, and he said, "Be very scared. There was nobody at it." He said, "This is mm-hmm. this augurs very very badly." for the future of yeah. cinema. And now I read in yesterday's paper that Cine World in Dublin has closed down something like three or 400 cinemas. And uh, mm-hmm. unless there's some kind of divine intervention, once these things start happening, this is a self-fulfilling mm-hmm. prophecy. So, I mean, I understand, you know, that movies will find a way, they always do, but this streaming business and everything leaves me cold. I mean, there are very few, right. for all the talk yeah. about, about, for all the talk of the golden age of television, there are very few of those box sets that I return to. Now, I, I'm not quite sure why that is. It may say, oh, you're too old. It isn't anything to do with that because I'm quite objective about these things. But what it might be to do with is excessive manipulation, too much craft, apart from picky blinders, maybe. You can see the writers at work in the room all the time trying to better each other. So you're, mm-hmm. you're missing the kind of curious, almost uh, twisted, adolescent imagination of the likes of David Lynch, you know, who took four years to get a razor head made, you know, killed, wanted to get his paintings moving, getting back to what you were saying about your dad telling the the story over and over and over again. I think that's what most writers tend to do. And David Lynch Mm -hmm. actually is telling the same story over and over and over again, not because he has no ideas, but because that the idea is so important to him that it burns within him and the yearning you spoke of. I mean, it'd be very interesting to investigate. I don't suppose people write longhand anymore, but if you had their papers 
and you know you investigate over a period of 10 years what themes keep resurfacing what are the constant obsessions and now they might be couched in different kind of formats and all the rest of it but they generally sure. if you mm -hmm. take McGahorn's work for example or Dylan's work or I don't know Sylvia Plath be a good example constant kind of return to the same ache or the same wound you know, mm. so I don't really yeah. find that in, in a lot of these, these, you know, clever clogs. People, to, uh, yeah, they seem to want yeah. everything to be very immediate and an instant gratification. Yes. Um, and, yes. uh, and it's not happening because, and it destroys, and this idea of binge in box sets, you know, there is something nice about waiting, you know, for the next week, for the next installment of something, so you process it. You process way, it, you, you see, know. that's the thing, you yeah. know, it takes you a week to process something like that, that's, uh, you know, that yeah. has been very important to the author. Now, I would exclude Peaky Blinders from that, because it's kind of unique, but... I yeah. think there's something to be discussed in that because you know, why you tell the story and if it's, I mean, they're even calling yeah. it content, which, you know, which tells its own story, really. Yeah, but it's, it's not, it's not, I mean, I don't know if you could argue maybe that the most purest form of art, the form of art left standing will be poetry, really. I tend to think it will be. Yeah. I think it will because it's not, it's not dependent on market. It's not dependent on trends. You know, it's, you know, whenever I want to understand about the world, I don't go to the latest Booker Prize winner. I go to Philip Larkin, usually. Cause, yeah. Not because he's better or yeah. any worse than anybody, but I understand what he's saying and what he's trying yeah. to say. Well, it, yeah. well, there's some sort of universal, I suppose, truth and yearning for some form of something to be true in, in the poem, I suppose, and, and that's the crux of it. And, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, it, yeah. And there's nothing, you're right, there's nothing to be gained from it, and it's very, nobody really runs into a shop to buy a poetry book. Sadly, I might be one of the, you know, some well, people do. Well, there are people who um, do it, you, there are yeah. people who do it. They may be <laughs> small in numbers, but that doesn't diminish the importance mm. of it. It doesn't matter, you know, we may no. be going back to a time where you have 20 or 30 people who understand your work. You know, we are looking at very yeah. strange times, you know, and yeah. there will be mm. big deals and the big splashes and everything else. But it's a commercial world now more than ever it was. And there'd be the last people standing that will survive financially. But, you know, the, the great thing about that was it was ever thus. You know, this mm. is a whole new phenomenon. Mm. Mm. Like in the 30s, 40s and 50s, you know, Kavanaugh and these people starved, you know. But that didn't diminish the fact that the great hunger now stands like a, a dolman, yeah. yeah, you know. Yeah, no, you're totally you know, right. One, yeah. One thing that I, mm -hmm. one thing <clears throat> that I'm thinking of now as you're talking, Pat, is is uh, vinyl uh, records. Yes. Because they obviously uh, kind of um, became a dead technology, became forgotten. Were 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 gathering dust in attics, <clears throat> and they don't have them. They're not a massive commercial uh, venture now. You wouldn't want to start a, a record shop, probably. Um, but they've survived, and there's a steady audience. And it's yeah. very similar to, for example, yeah. poetry. My hope, I my think it's hope very similar to what, poetry, what yeah. Would happen, yeah. Yeah, my hope is that what would happen is that maybe something like that happens with cinemas, that maybe cinemas yeah. obviously are going to take a massive yeah. hit. Yeah. And that what you yeah. get then yeah. is you get a particular yeah. type of cinema that survives. Yes. Like, and maybe there's, maybe yes. it's more expensive. I would imagine you're right it's there. Smaller. It's and, and it's maybe very, all very the people likely. who paid 20 euros to go to see, um, I don't know, I don't want to, it, it, like, not, I don't want to pick on a particular thing. They go and see the new Harry Potter or something. Millions of people will go and see it. Maybe those people will mm. be happier streaming Harry Potter, but the people who want to go and see the new David Lynch film are happy to pay yes. 20 euros to see it in, in a dark room with 20 or 30 other like-minded individuals. Yeah. Hope, yeah, I think you're I probably know, right. I mean, it's, it's, it's the only hope it has, like that. I would say, of survival, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I hope so. I hope Poor so. Alan, this has nothing to do with Galway. <laughs> sorry, although we oh, do sorry. have a lot of the art house cinema. <laughs> well, yeah. well, actually, yeah, I mean, Palace now, yeah, and there's a, there's not a bad, and an Omniplex has actually opened in Salt Till uh, relatively yeah. recently, and it's actually, it's uh, Art Deco, it's really nicely mm. kitted out, and the, it's Fantastic. actually, it's actually, pretty much um set up for 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 present uh, circumstances there's it's very very it roomy. Is. um and um but and i like this a idea of, on a um, yeah yeah they do it's and um 
I like this idea of special occasion cinema without meaning to sound too discerning about it. But um, I mean, Palace are doing a nice event uh, next month. I think Nick Cave on his own at the piano for a couple of hours. He recorded uh, himself in Alexandra Palace in North London there during back in June. So there's um, a special screening of this going out. So um, I'm not sure I got in the queue for, for tickets for that. Um, but yeah, and they um, had a David think, Lynch season, didn't they? They had a David Lynch season to finish, I think. Yeah, 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 and you know, and I can't believe you haven't seen and so forth. So I think it's these um, and the, they screened Cinema Paradiso there a couple of weeks back as well. So um, stuff you may have missed first time round or get to see again. I mean, I think um, and stuff that just you know insists on that big screen format. To, to it's like you're saying about um, re, you know watching an episode and waiting for the next week for it to come. I mean, when you 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 you, you need to absorb it i think um we haven't even we haven't it, even mentioned theater you know i mean no, I love jury's it. I out so what's going to happen for, there yeah yeah um collaborative projects you know um presentations that require collaboration of any kind i mean yeah I yeah mean, but like you were saying about cabin and the boys back in the day i mean they were starving and they found ways to endure and to go on and as you say, the works are still yeah. there and talked about. Yeah, of course. Um, we're drawing and to Catholic a close now. Jeff Goldblum. It's like Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park. Yeah, what does he say? Life will find a way. I'm sure. I'm sure <laughs> our good art will be the same. Well, on that note, I am going to actually. I'm going to put you very quickly on the spot. I know it's a brutal question, but I'll do it if you do it. If you were to choose, um, just to give a shout out to another story or two that you liked from the collection, um, please take this moment to uh, fire away before they shut us down. Um, Pat, give me a minute. I'm going to squib. I'm going to squib on the question and say that I like them all. Yeah, yeah, that's a hard that's question, that's Alan. <laughs> I don't, I don't like singling out, you know, best sweet in the box job. I like them all. <laughs> and I, yeah, and I, go, and I go for it's a great a so collection. I go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe we just single out Lisa, Lisa Frank and John Walls from Doyle Press for uh, publishing yeah. a wonderful yeah. anthology and for inviting yeah, yeah. Uh, a talented yeah, thank bunch you very of much writers. Indeed. Yeah, um, it is. It is. It's a wonderful anthology, and I'm delighted to have been a part of it. Um, okay, folks, uh, that more or less brings us to the end of this particular Red Line Book Festival event. See you, Danny. Um, I would like. Yeah. See you, Lynn. I would like. <laughs> okay. See you, Alan. <laughs> so, You're gone already, see you. Pat. <laughs> Sesame Street, isn't it? He's, he's uh, off yes, to watch the latest box set. He is. He can't. 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 He